The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, let us start. So let me first remind you what we did uh, uh, in last lecture. We proved we showed that the Wimberg Witten theorem forbids the existence of massless. In two particles, matrix spin two particles are hallmark of uh, of gravity, so that's why we look for them. In the same, so emphasize in the same space time, say a QFT leaves. Okay. So this theorem essentially says this: you will never have emergent gravity. Starts from a Lorentz invariant quantum field theory with a well-defined stress tensor. So as we already mentioned, it's a loophole of this theorem. Is that actually a emergent space, emergent gravity can actually live in a different space time. Okay. So, um, I think holographic duality. In fact, in holographic duality, the gravity leaps in one dimension higher. But we are not ready to go there yet. So in order to describe this thing, we still need to um, do some preparations. So the preparations, let me just outline the preparations we need to do. So the first thing we will do is black hole thermodynamics. So this will give hints for something called the holographic principle. Which is actually more general than the holographic duality discovered so far. And the second thing is we will also quickly Go over the large and gauge series, uh, the properties of the margin, say, a gauge series. So this gives hints something called the gauge strings. Duality. So the behavior of the large and gauge theory give you a strong hint that actually there's a string theory description for ordinary gauge theories. Okay. And then when you combine this in, these two things together, then you get what we have currently uh, uh, the holographic duality. And uh, 
then, a lit then we will also talk a little bit of string theory, a tiny bit, not a lot. So don't be scared. <laughs> so we also will uh, 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 talk a little bit about string theory. So in principle, actually, I can talk about holographic duality right now. But going over those aspects can help you to build some intuitions and also to have a broader uh, perspective than, um, than just presenting the uh, 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 duality directly. So before I start uh, today's uh, uh, lecture, do you have any questions regarding our last lecture and regarding uh, uh, this um, um, yeah, general remarks here. Yes. So moving forward, are we going to define uh, emergent gravity as the existence of a massless spin two particle? Uh, no, that we will not do. So how are we defining emergent gravity? Um, um, you construct Newton's law. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you will see it. You will see it when we have it. Yeah. Uh, it, it, essentially, you see the. Uh, uh, you see. Um, essentially, it's handed over to you. You don't have to go through that step. Yeah, you don't have to go through that step. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Um, any other questions? OK, good. Good. Let's start with black hole thermodynamics. So let me start by doing a little bit um, dimensional analysis, just to remind you important scales for the gravity. Okay. So the first thing is what we call the Planck scale. So in nature, we have fundamental constants. H bar, Newton constant, and the C, speed of light. And immediately after Planck himself introduced this H bar, he realized you can actually combine the three of them to come up with a map scale, which is just hc divided by gn. And this, if you plug in the explicit numerical value, is about 1.2 1 to the 10 to the 19 GeV divided by c squared. You can also write it in terms of the gram, which is about 2.2, 10 to the minus 5 gram. And then you can also have, we can also construct the length scale, which is hgn divided c cube, which is about 1.6 to the 10 to the minus 33 centimeter. And uh, pp, which is lp divided by c, OK? So, so this was discovered. So this was Planck introduced them in, 19, in 1899. So you may, uh, uh, most of you may know the story. And uh, just immediately after he introduced H bar, so, uh, so he discovered, so he introduced H bar in uh, 1899. In the same year, uh, he realized you can write down those numbers. And of course, those numbers meant nothing to him. Because at that time, we don't know special relativity. At that time, uh, he didn't know special relativity. He didn't know quantum mechanics. He didn't, uh, he, <laughs> essentially, he didn't know anything. But, but he famously said that these units, so he claimed those should be basic units of physics. And he also said these are the units 
that would retain their significance for all times and all cultures. Uh, he, even, uh, he even said that even will uh, uh, apply to, um, to aliens. But only after 50 years, so after 1950s, people uh, uh, get some sense. So many years after special relativity, uh, uh, many years after general relativity, and also quantum mechanics, etc., people started grasping the meaning of those scales. And uh, so, uh, so let me uh, uh, briefly review them. So you can get a feeling of the meaning of those scales by looking at the strength of gravity. So let me first start this example for electromagnetism, which you have a potential, which is E squared divided by R. Okay. Say so if you have two charged particle of charge E then the potential between them is E squared divided by R. And uh, for, for particle of mass m, then you also have Compton wavelengths. Say so if you have a particle with mass m, you also have Compton wavelength is h bar divided by mc. Okay. So you can get uh, rough measure of the strengths of electromagnetism, the interaction strengths of the electromagnetism by considering the following dimension is number, so which I call lambda E, which is the potential evaluated at the minimal, in quantum mechanics, essentially this is the minimal distance you can make sense of. Because once you go distance smaller than this, you can no longer, and, the, uh, uh, and then the quantum uncertainty will create the energy uncertainty bigger than m, then you can no longer talk about the particle sensitivity. Uh, then you can no longer talk about single particle in a sensible way. So this is essentially the minimal length scale you can talk about single particles. So, so this is essentially some energy scale. So you can compare this to the, say, the static mass of the particle. So this gives you uh, a measure of the strength of the electromagnetism. Of course, if you plug this in, you just get E squared divided by H bar C. And of course, we know this is the fine structure constant, which is indeed the, the coupling. Say you would do, um, indeed is the uh, uh, coupling in QED, okay? So you can do the same thing for gravity. So you can do the same thing for gravity. So for gravity, we have essentially G and say if you take two particles of mass M, then 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 the potential between them is gm m squared divided by r. And then again, you can define an effective strength for the gravity by evaluate this potential at Compton wavelengths divided by the static energy of the particle. And then you can just plug this in. So, so this is gn m squared divided by h bar divided by mc then divided by mc square. And then you find this is just equal to, this is equal to gn m square divided by h bar c, okay? So now if you compare with this equation, so, so this is just given by m square divided by mp square. Okay, so for gravity, this effective strength is just given by the mass of the particle. So because for gravity, the mass is like some kind of effective charge and divided by Planck scale, the, uh, this Planck mass square, okay? And you can also write it 
you can also write it as LP square divided by RC square, or, or just as this Planck lens divided by Compton wavelengths of this particle. Okay? So for most elementary particles, so, so for typical elementary particles, we know the m is always much smaller than mp. Okay? And then the lambda g would be typically much smaller than 1. So for example, say if you can see the electron, the electron mass would be, say, 5 to the 10 to the minus 4 GeV divided by C squared. Of course, this is much smaller than this Planck mass. And then you find that this ratio. So you can work out this ratio. So let's compare to the, to the corresponding strains for the electromagnetism. So this is about 10 to the minus 43, if you work this out. Okay. So this tells you the gravity is really weak. So for ordinary elementary particles, so the gravity is really weak. And so, so we can forget all about gravity until you reach the Planck mass or your Compton wavelengths reach the Planck lens. And then, um, then the gravity, then the effect of the quantum gravity will be important. So, so from this exercise, we know that the MP is the energy scale. That the effective gravity strengths become of order one. Become of order one. That is quantum gravity effect. Become significant. Okay. And uh, and the similarly, so, so LP is the corresponding length scale. Associated with such energy. Okay. So this give you a heuristic feeling, it give you a heuristic indication that the meaning of those uh, Planck scales. Okay. So there's another important scale associated with gravity. So any questions on this? Good. There's another important scale associated with gravity. It's called Schwarzschild radius. Schwarzschild radius. So the, just from dimensional analysis, the Schwarzschild radius can be argued as follows. So can see the, again, we can just uh, uh, even see it from Newtonian gravity. So say, let's consider object of mass m, OK? Then we ask, then we ask what is the distance, at what distance, maybe I should, at what distance? from it, the classical gravity becomes strong. OK? So, for this purpose, let's consider, say, a probe mass, say, m prime. So consider probe mass. OK? 
Okay. So I define a scale, which I call Rs, is I require the potential energy between m and m prime at such a scale Rs, then this become of order, say the again the energy, the static energy of this uh, probe particle, or of this probe mass. So if you cancel things out, then you find Rs is of order. Gn, m divided by c square. Okay. So, so this give you a, a, a um, uh, give you a scale. You can also ask. So this is from Newtonian gravity. Of course, the um, when your gravity becomes strong, uh, you should replace the Newtonian gravity by by Einstein relativity. And when you go to relativity, when you go to relativity, general relativity, then you find then there's a Schwarzschild radius. So uh, uh, there's a Schwarzschild radius which is given by 2gm divided by c squared, which corresponds to the size of a black hole. Corresponding to the size of a black hole. So this is a classical scale, purely classical scale. Just the scale which the classical gravity becomes strong. In particular, R s can be considered as the minimal. Then scale. One can probe a particle, an object of mass m. Okay. So classically, black hole absorb everything. So once you fall into black hole, you can never come back. And uh, so, so the minimal distance you can. Uh, uh, approach your, uh, an object of mass m is just given by the Schwarzschild radius. So when you go inside the Schwarzschild radius, you just fall into the black hole, and you can never send information out. Okay. And the one interesting compare, yeah, one interesting thing regarding the Schwarzschild radius, you said Schwarzschild radius increase with mass. Okay. If you increase the mass, the Schwarzschild radius increases. Okay. So in principle, it can be very large uh, when you can see the very large object, uh, when you can see the very massive object. So now, so let us summarize. Let us summarize. So for, for an object of mass m, There are two important scales. Two important scales. So one is just the standard Compton wavelengths. Okay. And the other is the Schwarzschild radius. So one is quantum and the other is classical. The other is classical. So let's take the ratio between them. Okay, let's take the ratio between them. So if you take the ratio between them, so um, yeah, so so let's forget about these two just to consider of order up to order one. So c squared divided by h bar divided by mc. And then this again give you gm m squared divided by h bar c. And this is again just m squared divided by mp squared. 
Okay. This again, just m squared divided m p squared, m p is the Planck mass. So, so let's consider the different scenarios. The first, let's consider just suppose the mass of the object is much much greater than m p. Okay. So in this case, then the Schwarzschild radius is much larger than the Compton wavelength. Much larger than the Compton wavelength. And essentially, all the physics is controlled by the classical gravity, because you can uh, 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 because you can no longer because you can no longer probe. Yeah, because this uh, Compton wavelength is much much inside the Schwarzschild radius, which you cannot probe. Okay, so the physics is essentially classical gravity. And uh, and the uh, um, quantum effects not important, so you don't have to worry about the quantum effect. So I will put code here. Uh, uh, not code. I will put some uh, yeah put some code here. Uh, just to yeah, you will see what this means. And the second possibility is for mass much, much smaller than MP. So in this case, then the Compton wavelength will be much, much greater than the, the Schwarzschild radius. Okay? So this is a quantum object. So the quantum size is much larger than the Schwarzschild radius. But we also know precisely in this regime, this lambda g is also very small. The effective strength of the gravity is also very, very small. So we also have found before that the lambda g is also very, very small. So in this case, as what we said here, the gravity is very weak. And not important. It's much, much weaker than other interactions. So you can essentially ignore them. Then, then that only left with this single square, which mass is off all the MP. And then, uh, as we said before, the quantum gravity is important. So let me just say quantum gravity important. OK? If this were the full story, then the life would be very boring, even though it would be very simple. Because then the only scale you need to worry about the quantum gravity is essentially mass of zero. It's only one scale. And it will took us maybe 100, if not 1,000 years to reach that scale by whatever accelerator or other uh, probes. And uh, so there's really no urgency to think about the quantum gravity, because the um, yeah right now we are at this kind of scale. Right now we are at this kind of scale. It's very very far from this kind of scale. But the remarkable thing about black hole. So this part of the physics is essentially controlled, say uh, by Schwarzschild radius, because the uh, Schwarzschild radius is the minimal. Uh, a classical radius you can uh, uh, you can achieve uh, yeah you can you can probe the system and the quantum physics is relevant but the remarkable thing is that it turns out that this statement is not correct this statement is not correct actually quantum effect is important so the remarkable thing is that the black hole can have quantum effect
manifest at a macroscopic level. Say at then scale of order swatch radius. Okay? So that's why it makes the black hole so interesting. And also makes the why black hole is such a rich source of insight and information if you want to know about quantum gravity. And as we will see, actually, we also contain a rich source of information about ordinary many body systems due to this duality. <clears throat> Any questions regarding this? Yes? So when we talk about the M much larger than MP, so the M is uh, not uh, only a elementary particle, it can be just uh, an object. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, if we it can be a bound state, so it can be a, here we are always talking about Quantum object, say say uh, yeah, quantum object, but, you, but can have mass very large. But still, a um, quantum object. Yeah, but but you will not see from the condition from a traditional way, for such a large mass object, you will not see its uh, quantum uncertainty because un quantum uncertainty is tiny. The Compton wavelength is very tiny, yes. and so the fluctuation is very small. And so you have to probe very, very small length scale to see its quantum flux. Uh, from traditional point of view, you have to probe very, very small length scale to, to see its quantum fluctuations. Yeah, yeah. And that length scale is much, much smaller than the Schwarzschild radius. Okay. Yeah. Any other question? Good. So let me, before we talk more about, talk more specific about the black holes, then let me just make one final remark. Is that in a sense, this Planck lens, as defined, uh, this lens scale as defined by Planck, can be considered as a minimal localization lens. Okay for the following reason. So let's first imagine in, in non-gravitational physics, say in non-gravitational physics, if you want to probe some short distance scales, okay, then it's easy if you are rich enough. Then, then you just accelerate the particles to very high energies, say, say, say E plus E minus, with P and minus P. So you can, uh, 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 then that can probe the distance scale. Then, then, probe, then this can probe length scales, say, of order H divided by P. Okay, so, so if you make, make the particle energy high enough, you can in principle probe as short as any scale as you want. Okay, you can anything uh, as far as you can make this P as large as you want. So in principle, You can take L all the way to zero. So this scale you can all the way to zero if you take P go to infinity. Okay? But in gravity this is not so. So so with gravity Gravity, this is not so. When your energy is much, much greater than EP, say, say the Planck mass, 
okay? Then as we discussed from there, so, uh, so this is the center of mass energy, okay? So if your center of mass energy becomes much, much larger than the Planck scale, Planck mass, then Rs controlled by the energy, yeah, let me call it P. Yeah, let me just forget about C. Let me just say. OK. Then the Swash radius from now on is so equal to 1. OK. So um, then the Swash radius will take over. as the minimal length scale. OK, so what's going to happen is that if you collide these two particles at the very high energies, then at a certain point, even before these two particles meet together, they will already form a black hole of the Schwarzschild sides, OK? If this energy is high enough. Then we form black hole, and then you cannot, then you can no longer probe uh, inside the Schwarzschild radius of that black hole. So that defines a new scale, which you can probe. Okay. So, so the funny thing about this Schwarzschild radius is that it's proportional to energy, rather than inverse proportional to energy, as the standard Compton wavelengths. Okay. So after a certain point, when you go beyond the Planck mass, when you further increase the energy, then you actually probe in the larger distance scales rather than smaller distance scales, okay, due to the funny thing about the gravity and the funny thing about the black hole. Okay? So, so, so actually, uh, uh, this scale increases with P. In Increase with your center of mass energy, okay? And the high energies goes to longer length scales. Okay? So this essentially defines the Planck length as a minimal scale one can probe. So when your center of mass energy is smaller than the Planck scale, than the Planck mass, then your Compton wavelength, of course, is larger than LP. But when this is greater than MP, then, then as we discussed here, then the Schwarzschild radius of a corresponding object will be greater than the, the, the Planck size and uh, uh, will, uh, uh, will be greater than the Compton wavelength uh, uh, and will be greater than the uh, 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 Planck size. And this gives you essentially the, uh, uh, the minimal radius to probe, OK? And uh, so, so in alternatively, we can also just reach the same argument. Uh, uh, simply, I can just write down a couple of equations. So let's consider you have uncertainty. Say, so suppose you have a position uncertainty data x, OK? And then the, then, the, then the uncertainty in energy or momentum associated with the, this data s is data p. But on the other hand, the distance you can probe must be greater than then the Schwarzschild radius associated with LP, theta P, OK, theta P. So, so if you combine these two equations together, 
So this is greater than gn h bar divided by delta p. So, so now I have suppressed the c. So you can see from this equation, you can see that delta x must be greater than h bar gn, which is lp. OK? Which is the lp here. Yeah, this is the same argument as this one, uh, but this is a little bit formal. And so, so the essence is that once your energy is big enough, then you will create a black hole, and then your physics will completely change. OK? Uh, the light where the black hole evaporates quickly, so they do not contain any information. Right. Yeah, so uh, uh, we, uh, yeah, let's, uh, 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 yeah, we will go into that. Uh, when the black hole evaporates, actually, you still don't probe the short, still harder to probe the short distance scale. Because the evaporate, yeah, we will talk about that uh, later. Yeah. So yeah, here just a heuristic argument uh, uh, to tell you that the because of this, the actually uh, the physics is very special. Okay, uh, uh, the uh, uh, the physics of the gravity is very special. Any other questions? Yes. Um, so uh, as a probe for quantum gravity, I was thinking, what if there were some um, phenomena in which gravity is weak? But and it's a macroscopic scale, but there's some kind of um, coherence happening that will maybe on the scale of galaxies or something like that that will um, allow quantum effects to be manifest, like an analogy of what happens um, in a laser or something like that. Um, yeah, uh, 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 that is black hole. <laughs> the black hole is the way which black hole, uh, black hole is the way which gravity can manifest. As a quantum effect at large distance scales, and we don't know any other ways to for for gravity to manifest uh, such uh, quantum physics at large distance scales. Yeah. Okay, so 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 let me conclude this uh, general discussion again by reminding you various regimes of gravity, various regimes of uh, the gravity or quantum gravity. So okay. So in this discussion, you should always, in the discussion I'm going to do in the next minutes, you should always think when I take the limit. I always keep my energy fixed. Okay, I keep the the energy scale I'm interested in fixed. I keep that fixed. Okay. So the classical gravity regime is the regime which you take h bar goes to zero, take the Newton constant finite. Okay. And the regime of a particle physics. Which would normally be sometimes say QFT in the fixed space time. So this is a quantum field theory in the in the fixed space time, including curved. Okay, including curved. So this is a regime which h bar is finite. But you take the Newton constant and go to zero, okay? And then there's of course the quantum gravity regime, which is the GM and the H bar both finite. And there's a very interesting regime, which is actually the the regime most of us work with. So there's also something called the semi-classical regime. For quantum gravity. So this is the regime you keep h bar finite. And you expand 
we expand the system in Newton constant, OK? So around, say, expand your whatever quantity in Newton constant around, say, G Newton equal to 0. So G Newton equal to 0 is the classical, regi uh, is the classical regime. No, uh, it's, the, it's, the, uh, it's the regime the gravity is not important, but including h bar. And now you can take into account the quantum gravity effect semi-classically by expanding around the GN. Okay? So this is normally what we call semi-classical regime of gravity. Yes? Do we know that G goes to zero is a smooth limit? It's not a similar point? Yeah, uh, 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 this is a very good question. So, so this is indeed, so this is indeed the question. Uh, indeed, the most of the puzzles regarding black hole is in this regime. So, our current understanding of quantum physics of black hole is in this semi-classical regime, and uh, you you treat the any matter field h bar finite, but the gravity is weak. And uh, so, so there are various indications that this limit is actually not smooth, f but, but for only for very subtle questions. For, for, gener uh, for simple questions, for typical questions, actually, this is a limit. This limit is smooth, but there can be very subtle questions which this limit is not smooth. And one such question is this so-called black hole information loss and involving uh, the subtle limit of taking this, uh, yeah, involving subtlety of taking this limit. Any other questions? OK, and this is a regime actually we will work with most. OK, this is a regime we will work with most. And so, so we will always, uh, in particular, in later, so right now I'm keeping the h bar explicitly, but later I will also set h bar equal to 1. And so h bar will equal to, uh, so we are always typically work with this regime, the h bar equal to 1, and then you will have uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, 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 then, uh, uh, then you take into account the effect of GN uh, in, in the perturbation theory, OK? Good, good. So now let's move to the black hole. OK, so with this, uh, yes? Maybe one, just some random talk to people also work in the other semi-classical regime, I mean, finite GN, but uh, expand H bar. Yeah, this is not, um, um, not so much. Um, it's because the, um, it's because it's easy. In some sense, it's easy. So, so in the sense, we are doing a little bit both. Uh, uh, so, yeah, so, Later, uh, uh, right now, uh, I don't want to go into that. You will see the effective, uh, the effective coupling constant control the, the quantum gravity effect is, in fact, the h bar times gn. It's h bar times gn. And so, so the quantum gravity effect will be important when the h bar times, when you do perturbation theory in h bar times gn. Yeah, yeah. So when I say uh, uh, you are doing things in gn, essentially, because I'm fixing h bar, so you're actually doing perturbation theory in h bar gn. Yeah, so you have to do both, yeah. Any other questions? Good. Right. So now let's talk about the black hole. So let's first talk about the classical geometry. OK. So here I will assume you already have some background in GR, in general relativity. And for example, you have seen things like Schwarzschild metric, et cetera. And if you have not seen a Schwarzschild metric, it's also OK. Uh, um, uh, I think uh, uh, you should be able to uh, to follow uh, uh, what I'm going to say. 
So, so for simplicity, uh, right now, let me consider zero cosmological constants. OK, zero cosmology constant, cosmological constant. OK, zero cosmological constant corresponding to, we consider symptotically um, Minkowski space time. And uh, so, so in the space time of a zero uh, cosmology constant, and then the space time metric. Due to an object of mass m, okay, can be written as so. This is the famous Schwarzschild metric. And uh, so, so of course, here we are assuming this is a, a spherical geometric. And the neutral, et cetera. There's no, say, this object does not carry any charge. And then this M and this F is given by 1 minus 2N mass divided by r, or is equal to rs divided by r. OK, so this rs is the Schwarzschild radius. So now c is always equal to 1. OK. So if this object, so we consider this object is very close symmetric. If this object have a finite size, then, then of course this metric only is valid outside this object, okay. But if the size of this object is smaller than this Schwarzschild radius, then this is a black hole, okay. And uh, the black hole is distinguished by even horizon. At r equal to r s, okay. At r equal to r s, say so at r equal to r s, you you see that this f becomes zero, okay. So f equals become zero. So essentially, at here, g t t, so the metric for the t t component is uh, become zero, and the g r r, the metric before the the R component you could be, it become infinite, OK? And another thing is that when R becomes smaller than Rs, then F switch sign. So S become negative. And then in this case, then the r become time coordinates, then the t becomes spatial coordinates. Okay, when you go inside the r equal to r s. Okay, this is just a feature of this uh, metric. So now let me say some simple. Uh, now let me uh, list some uh, uh, some facts about this metric. So most of them I expect you know. Actually, uh, I expect you know all of them. But it's um, just to remind you, because some of those facts will be important later. OK? So these are mostly reminders. 
So first, this metric, if you look at this metric itself, is time reversal invariant. Okay. Because you can, if you take t go to minus t, of course the uh, uh, yeah invariant on the t goes to minus t. Okay. So this actually because of this, it, this cannot describe a real black hole. So the real life black hole arise from a gravitational collapse. And the gravitational collapse cannot be a time symmetric process. Okay, so this cannot describe, so this does not describe a real black hole. But it's a good approximation to the real life black hole after this object has stabilized. So after the gravitational collapse has finished. Um, yeah, so this is the, um, so this is a mathematical, in some sense it's a mathematical idealization of real life black hole. Okay, so this is the first remark. So the second remark is that the, despite this GRR goes to infinity, this metric component goes to infinity, so the space time is non singular at the horizon. Okay. So you can check it by computing, say, curvature invariants of this uh, metric. You find none of the, all the curvature uh, invariants that they are well defined. So, so this horizon is just a coordinate. Uh, 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 you can show that this horizon is just a, a coordinate singularity. Which we will see. Actually, we will see it maybe in next lecture, or, or maybe at the end of today's lecture, that it, it just this coordinate r and the t coordinate become singular. The coordinate itself becomes singular. <clears throat> okay. So this t, we normally call it Schwarzschild time. So let me just introduce a name. So this t, we call it Schwarzschild time. So Schwarzschild found this solution while fighting First World War. In the really in the battlefield, and uh, and a couple of months after he finished this uh, metric, he, he he died from some disease. <laughs> right, this is that. So so another thing, you can easily check yourself that r equal to r s the horizon. It's a null surface. It's a null hypersurface. It's a null hypersurface. But null hypersurface just say this surface contains null, uh, 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 contain uh, uh, um, geodesics which are null. Okay. And this is a, the third remark is an extremely important one which we will use many times in the future. You said the horizon is a surface of infinite redshift 
compared to the infinite redshift from the perspective of observer at infinity. Okay. Uh, so let me save time not to add this qualifying remark from from the perspective of the observer at infinity. So so now let me just uh, illustrate this point uh, a little bit more explicitly. So let's consider observer. Consider an observer. So let me call O H. So this is just at some hypersurface R, which is close to the horizon. Yeah, uh, some say some uh, at some place which is close to the horizon. Okay. Slightly outside the horizon, and let us consider another observer, which I call O infinity, which at r equal to infinity. Okay, very far away from the black hole. So at so let's first look at this observer. So at r equal to infinity. The new metric, so at i equal to infinity, this f just become 1, because when you r equal to infinity, this r just become 1. And then this become the standard Minkowski space time written in the spherical coordinates. So, so we just have yeah, just standard the uh, Minkowski's time uh, written in the spherical coordinates. And, uh, and from here, you can immediately see, so this t, this is what we call swash of time, t, is the proper time for this observer at infinity, say for all infinity. OK? So now let's look at, at some, some place i equal to rh. So at r equal to r h, then the, the metric is given by minus f r h d t square with the rest. Okay. And the to to define the proper time for the observer at the, we can just directly write it as minus d tau square. So that's the proper time observed by observer at this hypersurface. Okay? So so then we conclude, so let me call it tau h. So we conclude that the proper time at the, for O h is given by f one half i r h times dt. Okay? So it relates to the proper time at infinity by this factor. So, so if I write it more explicitly, so this is 1 minus Rh divided by Rs 1 half times dt. So we see that So we see that as Rh, suppose this observer, the location of this observer, the location of this observer approaches the horizon. So if Rh approaches to Is, then this d tau h divided by dt will go to zero. Okay. So, so that means compare to the time at infinity, the time at r equal to rs becomes infinite snow. 
Okay, so so approximate. Let me say, becomes infinite snow. Okay. So that means any finite interval, any finite proper time interval for observer at O H, uh, uh, for this O H. When you view it from infinity, uh, uh, become infinitely long. Okay, become very long time scale. Okay, become very long time scale. So you can also invert this. Uh, you can also re uh, uh, invert uh, 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 this relation. Oh, okay, you can also re uh, invert this relation. Say, say, suppose some event of energy. With energy EH, with proper energy, with proper energy EH, say for this observer at OH, for this observer OH, then because of this time, because of the time relation between them, okay? Because of the time relation between them, then, then from the perspective, from the perspective of this observer at infinity, the energy is given just by by you invert the relation between the time, okay? Because of the energy and time conjugate, so so the e infinity become e h times this f one half r h. OK? So, so this just again say in the slightly different way that for any finite, any finite EH, prop, local proper energy, OK? So this is a local proper energy for the observer at OH. This E infinity, the same event viewed from the from the perspective of the observer at infinity goes to zero as Rh goes to Is. Okay? So that so that is this is infinitely ref, red shifted. Okay. Become infinite red shift. So any process, so any process with local proper energy viewed from infinity uh, a corresponding to very, very low energy process. Okay. So this actually will play a very important role. This feature will play a very important role when later we talk about holographic duality and uh, its implication, say, say, for the field theory, et cetera. Yes? So this is just a gigantic comment, but I think you need a minus sign in front of your Fs just to make sure your proper time is imaginary. Uh, sorry, a, a, a rich mala sign? Um, in the D tau stage. You mean here? You mean here or here? Below that. Below that. Below that. Yeah. Oh, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. S sorry. Thank you. I wrote it wrong. It should be RSIH. <laughs> yeah, 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 because IS is above. Sorry, yeah. So R S is above, so I evaluate as A R R H. So R H is downstairs. Yeah. Thank you. So so R H is down. So I always can see the R H is great equal to R S. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. And uh, so some other fact, and again, I will just list them. I will just list them. If you're not, not familiar with them, uh, uh, it should be very easy for you to go through them, uh, to re-derive them uh, with a little bit uh, uh, knowledge in GR. So number four is that it takes a free fall 
Free fall means we just follow geodesics, OK? Free fall of a traveler, a finite proper time. to reach the horizon, say from the infinity. But infinite swash your time. So, so you can easily check that they actually take infinite swatch of time for object to fall through the horizon. But from the, uh, from the free fall observer itself, it's actually just finite proper time. And so from the perspective of the observer at infinity, it looks like this object never falls into the black hole. It's just frozen at the horizon. So, and the, and the, uh, Another remark is that once inside the horizon, that means when r becomes smaller than rs, the traveler cannot send signals out. Signals to outside. Nor can he escape. Okay, so that's why this is called even horizon. So we will see this uh, uh, slightly later. Uh, so, uh, 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 in next lecture, we will see this explicitly. Um, so finally, there are two important geometric quantities associated with the horizon. Two important geometric <clears throat> OK. So the first one is the area of the spatial section. So suppose, so let's consider we are at i equal to rs. And then and here, you just set this i equal to rs. And then this is a two-dimensional sphere. Okay? So this two-dimensional sphere goes running to a spatial section, say, of the horizon. So, um, so first is the A, is the area of a spatial section. OK? So, so you can just say, let's look at the area of this part um, with the r equal to the uh, horizon radius. So, so this just gives you a equal to a h equal to 4 pi r s square. And this r s is 2 g m. So this becomes 16 pi g m square. OK, so this is one of the key quantities of a black hole horizon. It's, it's what we call the horizon area. OK? Might we call this horizon area. And the B is called the surface gravity. B is called surface gravity. So the surface gravity is defined by the acceleration of a stationary observer at the horizon
I smash it at infinity. OK, at infinity means that the yeah, spatial infinity. So, so you can, uh, if you're not familiar with the, this concept of surface gravity, you can find it in standard textbooks, for example, the words, say page 158, and also section. OK, let's try to check it there. So say, suppose you have a black hole. Say this is a Schwarzschild radius. Of course, things want to fall into the black hole. So if you want to remain at a fixed location outside the black hole, then you really have to accelerate. Okay, you have to fire some engine to keep yourself to stay there. And you can, yeah, you can calculate what is the acceleration you need to be able to stay here still. Okay. And once you are closer and closer to the horizon, that acceleration becomes bigger and bigger, eventually become infinity when you approach the horizon. But because of this redshift effect, okay, because of this redshift effect, when, when this acceleration is viewed from the units for observer and infinite and infinity, then you have infinity divided by infinity, and then turns out to be finite. And, uh, uh, and this is called the surface gravity. It's normally called the kappa. Normally called the kappa. And this is one of a, a, a basic quantities, basic geometric quantity of the horizon. So, so we're not deriving here. I don't have time. Uh, uh, and if you want to see, it, uh, uh, see this Watts book. So you can calculate that this is just given by 1 half. The derivative of this function f Evaluated at the horizon, uh, evaluated at the horizon location. Okay, so f is equal to zero at the horizon, but f prime is not. Okay, so so you can easily calculate. So this is one over two r s from here, and uh, is equal to one over four g m. Okay, so this is another very important quantity. For the for the black hole, actually, I think right now is a good place to stop. Um, okay, so let's stop here for today, and the next time we will describe. Then we will from here we will discuss the causal structure of the black hole, and then you will see uh, explicitly some of those statements if you ha if you have not seen them before. <coughs>